there are a lot of exciting other IoT sessions. Please make sure to check them all. But I think everybody here is 302 IoT security, the new frontiers. Uh, before we will start, let me introduce my co-presenter and myself. Uh, we have Jan Metzner, um, AWS IoT Specialist Security Architect. We have Kerry Meleski, um, Senior Director, Security Architecture and Software from Microchip. And my name is Anton Schmagen. I'm Security Architect uh, with AWS Professional Services. So me and Jan is from AWS, and Kerry is a good partner of AWS. Um, in this session, <clears throat> for those of you who are new to AWS um, IoT, and especially the security domain of it, uh, we'll briefly touch on some uh, basic features, but in this session we would like to concentrate um, on the new uh, features that we released uh, since last reInvent, um, and also on the architectural patterns that helps uh, customer to move massive AWS workloads to AWS IoT platform easily, um, and also uh, to leverage the existing uh, platform, the existing workload in the field, and bring them into the AWS. Um, with the last events, uh, there was a lot of publicity about IoT security. Um, and the last events I, I meant uh, is basically the attacks on Brian Krebs' uh, blog and Dean DNS, and recently, actually, like two days ago, there was a huge attack uh, in Germany on the home routers. So there are a lot of publicity, but everything can be brilliantly summarized in a quote by Sarah Cooper. Um, what I can add to it is that this article is also saying we have to have a strong uh, legislation. And we know that whatever can be connected will be connected. And we know that the number of devices is going to be huge. And I specifically didn't put any numbers on the y-axis because it doesn't matter if it's going to be 20, 25, or 50 billion devices by 2020. We know that it's going to be a lot. And we know that the security, uh, like a default security on, this pass, uh, on these devices, uh, they can be better. Uh, I compiled this word cloud from the passwords that can be found in the source code from the Mirai bot. Uh, it's the one that, that was hitting the uh, DIN DNS. And we know that a lot of IoT protocols, they've been designed for specific uh, for, for, for specific reasons, but security often is not one of those, or it was an afterthought. But this is not typical apocalyptic talk, and we, we will not drown in our own tears here. Um, instead, what we would like to present is the how we as a technologist, engineer, scientist, can actually, through the through technology, solve a lot of friction. Um, pretty much like Niels Bolin solved the friction of drivers to put the seat belt. Because at that time, there was a two, two design of seat belts, the five-point harness or strap belt. So he brought all his vision and experience from aerospace industry but really focus on the customer and really focus on the driver safety, uh, safety versus the actually car safety. Um, when you're designing your uh, threat model for the IoT deployments, it's not, the attackers will not be going through your uh, most secure features. They would be attacking the, they would be attacking for example, provisioning, if you've not done it right. They would be attacking the communication between, um, between the access point and, and your device, or the cell tower, uh, or the totally off-band. So you have to really consider all these attack vectors. 
And we can logically separate those into the device security, transport security, or system or backend security. And obviously the risk factor is goes, um, increases as, we, as we're moving up the ladder. So if you, have a, if you have a physical access to the device, you can employ a um, number of attacks uh, with a relatively cheap hardware uh, right now. And as the system on modules and system on chips becoming more and more integrated, um, there are also a number of attacks that um, allowing you to utilize like a common baseband. You can attack the your, your um, GPS, uh, which is totally unauthenticated, and gain some privileged access to the cell base, baseband. Um, what is really interesting here that a lot of uh, silicon manufacturers uh, putting secure modules and secure technologies like uh, ARM, uh, TrustZone, or Intel SGX uh, into the system on module, system on chips. Um, so th this is this is the slide I was I was referring to. Uh, when we're talking about the when we're talking about transport security, um, there are no really uh, attacks that can leverage uh, per se the, the data communication because in our case it's protected by uh, TLS encryption. But what is important that um, adversaries and attackers, they can take off the entire infrastructure if they attack the cell tower or the, the number of access points. Also, they can gain quite a lot of information through the metadata, when your device is connecting, what AP addresses uh, they're coming from, and so on and so on, if they have, if they would be able to, uh, to do some uh, man-in-the-middle attacks. Um, so in this space, uh, AWS working with a number of uh, telecommunication providers, um, SI, Transitel is um, two examples that allows you to tunnel the mobile carrier network into the, uh, into the AWS VPC, which is pretty interesting. And on a backend security, <clears throat> we have, um, uh, as any AWS service, um, we're responsible for securing of um, uh, security of the cloud, security of this service, and you have to properly configure it. So while we're giving you all these bits and pieces, <clears throat> you, need to, you need to properly put your policy, you need to properly configure the authentication, authorization, um, leverage the device registry, things, things types, um, Control, uh, control the uh, the data transit from the AWS IoT service to the backend services um, properly, and obviously protect your control plane as well. Um, and on top of the passive uh, uh, and uh, uh, not not only you have to you have to really uh, think about passive security measures, but also proactive anomaly detection is really, really important. As with any other uh, AWS IoT, uh, AWS service, AWS IoT, you can leverage uh, the cloud trail for the control plane or um, cloud watch logs for the data plane in order to detect the anomalies. For example, if you know that your device is coming every 30 seconds from the deep sleep mode and publishing some data, and suddenly you have a thousand, uh, thousand connection per second, you know that something is wrong, and it has to be automated. So through the CloudWatch events, um, you can rework your certific uh, certificate or make it inactive for a short period of time uh, until you will inv investigate and do the proper forensic analysis on it. So <clears throat> that's all great. Uh, but what exactly AWS IoT offers in terms of the in terms of the security, in terms of when we're connecting something to it? Um, 
The new feature that probably many of you are uh, already using, but since the last reInvent, uh, we released the support for the WebSocket. And what it allows you to do, it uh, allows you to use the standard HTTPS connection, uh, but leverage the entire uh, PubSub architecture. Uh, and also very granular, very fine-grained access control to your things that connecting through the, uh, through the web sockets. You can leverage think attribute, you can leverage think types, uh, and you can, you can leverage the policy variables I'm gonna be talking a little bit later. <clears throat> so, authentication, uh, very important. We need to know what, uh, who can we trust. Um, obviously, aside of the jokes, like from 10 years ago that you don't know who is on the other uh, side of the browser, whether it's a man, a girl, or a cat uh, behind the keyboard. There are no keyboard in the devices, right? So it's really important that we will have very strong identity here. Um, so for the, for the devices that connecting through the MQTT protocol, um, we're leveraging um, uh, TLS 1.2, um, and we're leveraging the mutual certificate authentication. For the, for the users or um, mobile, uh, it, it can be mobile, it can be, it can be even devices that connecting through the web sockets, uh, there are two ways um, you can use the standard AWS Signature version four, or um, you can employ the, the Cognita, uh, Cognita authentication for those who, uh, who don't know, Amazon Cognito is an um, amazing authentication uh, service and federation service that allows you to federate from multiple identity providers such as uh, Amazon, Twitter, Google, Facebook, um, even your enterprise SAML identity providers, or uh, we recently, recently re released uh, user pools that you can, you can basically use to, um, to do the registration for, for your mobile users. So um, Amazon Cognito is totally supported. And between the services, hang, handing over the data from AWS IoT to, for example, S3 or DynamoDB um, or Elasticsearch clusters, uh, we're using the standard um, AWS IAM uh, signature before authentication. For the authorization <coughs> part, it's a standard IAM uh, standard IAM policy. The, the the policy syntax is not changing <coughs> whether you're using uh, whether you're using the uh, users that connected through uh, through the web sockets or the things that connected through uh, MQTT. You're applying it in a, in a, to, the, to the particular service, but pretty much the, the policy uh, syntax is the same. What is really exciting that <coughs> this year we, uh, actually quite recently we released a um, number of policy variables that allows you to scale your policy um, based on a, inherited attributes that had been provisioned off band completely. So uh, before you had, you had to explicitly specify the policy for particular thinking device. Here we can leverage any field in a, in a certificate and create these policy variables uh, that would allow you, the moment the device connect, it can be, it can be uh, jailed into its own topic or connect to, to specialized topic uh, or for example you can uh, you can bridge the user and the user devices very similar very elegant solution um, same thing you can utilize the think attributes and think um, think type uh, uh, in order to, to craft your, your policy in a, in a very dynamic way. So, um, back to the, to the reInvent uh, 2015, 
um, we were able to build the devices. Uh, uh, we were released at that time uh, two methods how you, how you were able to onboard your devices. One is um, through signing the uh, certificate signing request through AWS uh, Certificate Authority. And the another one is completely generating the private keys and certificate in AWS Certificate Authority. It's very important that <clears throat> we actually had a very strong security story when we, re when we released this service <clears throat> because um, we, we kind of went for the best of the breed at the time. Um, only TLS 1.2 totally isolated certificate authority that, that were you, you able to control your, um, your certificates. Uh, you don't need to rely on it on, on timing. Uh, so we eliminated totally the timing attacks, like DeLorean attack, for example. Um, and um, um, finally, the mutual certificate authentication. So uh, two methods that we were able uh, that, that you were able to leverage last year is either generate a key pair and certificate and burn it into, into your device or generate the, um, generate the private key on your device then just sign it through the AWS Certificate Authority. This year we're releasing, uh, we released a number of features and Jan will talk about those. Thanks, Anton. <clears throat> okay, so um, Anton talked about hey, how can we generate certificates on our side. They are signed with um, our certificate authority. Uh, then you're burning them to, to the devices and they are shipped. Um, obviously, uh, these are your devices. So actually you should also own the certificate authority for those devices. And also there's an implication because you need to actually call AWS IoT for all the certificates. So if you're in the production line, um, it's not an asynchronous process. So you really call for every device while you're provisioning this uh, AWS IoT. So what we come up with is, okay, bring your own certificate. So which means you bring your own certificate authority you're provisioning the devices, I mean offline, but you don't need to have a connection at all. And at some point you're registering the certificate. So still you need to register each and every certificate because yes, it's your certificate authority, but we don't know uh, the, um, the IoT policies that should be attached for each and every device because each and every device perhaps should get different uh, policies and so on. And this is something that you need to do actually. And that's why you still need to have this call. So how does it look like? So you have the, your certificate authority is somewhere in an HSM module. Um, you're provisioning uh, the certificates in your manufacturing line. And uh, at some point you need to register your certificate authority, could be later on could be now. So if you bring, for example, you have already a fleet out there with a lot of devices, you can now register your certificate authority with us. Um, we need to prove that you really own this. So we send you a regist registration code. You're signing actually this registration code with a certificate. Um, and then you are uploading the certificate um, together with your CA certificate. And th in this way, we actually know that this is really a certificate you own. And afterwards, uh, you still need to register, actually you provision the devices with your own certificates and we still need to attach a, a policy. So we need to register the certificate, so the device certificate and attach a policy. So this is a small demo recording that just use, uses OpenSSL to generate uh, a CA. Um, then it will generate actually um, a device certificate. So actually very easy, not production grade, yes. So it now generates just a, um, a folder. In this folder, it, it creates a new key, it creates a new certificate, it signs the certificate with the CA certificate. And then you are mo almost done. Uh -huh. Good, but what now? I mean, uh, you can bring those devices online. 
um, and you need to still register them. Um, there must be an, a little bit more automated way because obviously you need to still need to have all those t certificates. You need to, um, in a batch perhaps, register them. Actually, you don't know perhaps where the device comes online. They might come online in Europe or in the US. And they should perhaps uh, be connected to the nearest region. So how do you do this? If you don't know this on the manufacturing line, which certificate should be, pub uh, should be connected to which region and so on. So what we released in the summer is uh, just-in-time registration. Uh, just-in-time registration allows you this to automate <coughs> the process. Um, actually, in a, in a way that you can uh, do whatever you want. And I will illustrate this a little bit. Um, we have, as before, we are provisioning the certificates with USCA certificates. You do, you do that, for example, on your manufacturing line. Could be in China, could be somewhere. Um, you're shipping the devices. The device has only one knowledge. It has an endpoint and it has a, it's, its identity and its certificate. The endpoint could be just a DNS point which you control. It connects to the nearest region where AWS IoT lives. The device comes online and then actually the event is sent. The registration is done. I will show you in a second. And then the devices are online and can be used. So we have already seen this. So how the CA signs a certificate for the device. So let's put this by side. We still need to register the CA certificate, so we get a registration code, we register the CA certificate, and then comes the magic. A device comes online, it connects to AWS IoT. AWS IoT knows the CA certificate, but has no clue, okay, is this uh, certificate allowed, what policies should be attached, and so on. AWS IoT emits an event, it's a normal event or on our broker. And uh, in this case, actually, a Lambda function is listening on this event and can do something. And this something could be, it's first of all, she should check, okay, is uh, this certificate on the rev revocation list? And then obviously, hey, I want to activate the certificate because it's at the moment in a pending activation state. We will not allow uh, this device to connect actually, but we know, okay, hey, there should be something done. So you need to activate the certificate and then you need to attach a, a policy because without a policy, still the device cannot connect. And afterwards, you can do whatever you want. You can update the database, <coughs> uh, you ten, can add more attributes, whatever. So how does this look like? Um, you see here uh, a CA certificate um, that was built. We see uh, a few Certificates also already in there. Then we need to have a Lambda function. The Lambda function is very simple. In this case, it's, and it's written in Python. The most important part, it actually just gets the event, which means it knows actually which certificate ID is requesting the access. And then it attaches a policy and activates the status of the certificate. This is an asynchronous process. So we, you will see perhaps later on that, yeah, there will, might be a disconnect. This is the integration. So the, uh, the rule actually just listens on this event. It's a special event from, from our side. And then the Lambda function is invoked. So let's see how this is done. Okay, it takes some time. So what is done on our side, we still need to create the certificates for the device. So we create a new folder. Okay, first of all, we need to update the certificate, uh, um, the CA certificate, so that we enable the automatic process. Then we create a new device and get it online and it will just connect to AWS IoT and will be there and will be connected. We'll show this later live, but just that you know, it's an automatic process. You don't only need to have on the device actually an endpoint. You can control this via DNS, and this could be somewhere, and you can control this uh, depending on the device location. We have another thing as well. So uh, 
things, uh, well, users are also things, so we need to have uh, the ability to connect users as well. Um, with Amazon Cognito, we have the ability to use uh, actually what is called unauthenticated identities. So we can give you access to some of uh, the AWS resources. And what uh, Cognito is doing is just handing out temporary access credentials uh, with a policy, with an IAM policy attached to it. So you're configuring actually the access in an IAM policy. And then you, for example, you can directly connect via WebSockets to um, AWS IoT and read or perhaps even write uh, to some portions of the pub subtopics. For authenticated users, you really want to have fine-grained access permissions. So you want to have a, a similar scenario what you do have with the certificates as well. So first of all, you're identifying the, the user with an identity provider. This is the identity provider you actually configure. Um, Amazon Cognito and the identity provider, you're actually ch exchanging uh, information. Um, your browser, your mobile phone or whatever is uh, sending something to Amazon Cognito. Actually, for example, for Facebook, it's an access token. It's exchanged to an uh, IAM token. And then you could actually connect to AWS IoT, but we want to have fine grained access permissions, so you need to add an additional IoT policy with really fine grained access permissions because the IAM policies, they are generic, they are for all users the same. And with this scenario, you can really have uh, fine grained access for all and each uh, user, which means I can have only the permissions to open my car with my phone. And this is all guarded through AWS IoT. So, this was, everything was software. What about real hardware? And yeah, we have seen software, you need to create the certificates and so on. Yes, okay, there's an HSM module and so on. But how can this scale? We have a lot of customers that also, hey, I don't want to do this in my manufacturing line. I can't do this. Uh, how can I do this later on or can I do something else? And actually, I'm really proud that we have uh, Kerry here. He will introduce this later on uh, in details. But what they have done is actually they created um, a security module where they actually uh, sign on their side with the EU certificate, the certificates, the device certificates, put them on this chip. It's a temper safe chip. They ship this to you and you just, similar to uh, all the other chips, you put this on your device and the rest, what you have seen before, is just working out of the box. And we will now show two demos how this is done. Um, yes. <clears throat> uh, so the first demo is uh, we have a partner, we have an AWS uh, IoT partner from Ireland, um, Sasanta, and they're producing really optimized embedded firmware. Um, so, um, and and they, they have it for, for multiple architecture, but um, uh, how many of you know what is the ESP8266? Uh, yeah, it's pretty maker-friendly uh, board. Uh, what was interesting <clears throat> that we challenged them a little bit <clears throat> to actually utilize that chip uh, and use it together with the with the microchip um, uh, crypto crypto module. <clears throat> um, what was interesting about it is that the, even, even the architecture is different. It's not ARM architecture, it's actually a silica core uh, on ESP8266. Um, this, is the, this is the photo of, the, of our like, small setup. <clears throat> so on the right hand side, it's not MCU with the ESP8266 module. Um, <clears throat> the small breakout board <clears throat> on a, in the middle is a uh, microchip AT, uh, ECC 508A. <clears throat> uh, in fact, they have it in an even different packaging, which is even smaller. And then, then we have a button. Um, so if Demogods is uh, cooperating, we'll try to 
to show it right now. So what, what I'm gonna do, um, I'm gonna to show the board um, first on the, on the Wolfcam. Sorry. Um, so this is, this is our setup. And right now I switch back to, to my laptop and I will just update the two configuration parameters that will allow this board to connect to the access point. It was newly provisioned with the totally off-band certificate, uh, ACC certificate there, and it will connect to the Amazon IoT endpoint right now, and hopefully it will provision itself again if, if, them, <laughs> if Demogods is cooperating. Um, so, I'm saving new configuration. So we connect it to, to our Wi-Fi endpoint. And you see the first, you see that um, over here we have the crypto chip initialization and we have MQTT disconnect. <clears throat> MQTT disconnect because of the asynchronous nature of um, just-in-time provisioning that, that Jan was saying. So you have to implement the automatic reconnect in your firmware. And subsequent reconnect, we already have the certificate in the, um, so here we have only two certificate. If I will update this screen. Now we have the new one with the automatic policy assigned to it. And um, if we will go back to the slides, um, if you will go to this URL, And we, we, can, we can do the same here. Um, so this is actually just unauthenticated access to uh, the broker. So we're connecting. I will switch over to your laptop. <clears throat> the Wi-Fi is a little bit slow. For those of you who who already um, who already connected they should see that events gonna be a meeting. <clears throat> I don't know what's happening on our side. So, partial success. <laughs> um, okay, and Jan will, will talk about, uh, about the another demo with the uh, microchip kit. Switch over. Okay, so what I've built is actually this thing. It's a small provisioning server. So you see, actually, this is uh, the demo board from Atmo. There's the same chip on this. Um, you the, see, the chip is actually just a tiny dot over yeah. there. <laughs> so this one here. It's hard to see, but it's really tiny. Um, what you see here, this is not a USB stick, actually, it's a signer token, so the signing certificate is in there. It will not leave this token, so it's actually is HSM in a box. Uh, in so a pocket. In a pocket, yeah. Um, so for demonstration purposes, really nice. Uh, so you have really here an HSM, you have uh, the Atmo chip, and we will provision this. So this is done actually at the factory uh, on their side but obviously you can try it out here. So um, let's connect to um, this guy here. Um, 
and start the provisioning process. What you see is it's connecting to the signer, it's connecting to the board, Then it needs to get also the signing certificate. It needs to uh, create a new key and uh, signs and create a certificate and then provisions this uh, to the chip itself. And you see we have now provisioned this. Then you're shipping this thing here. Okay, it's pre-provisioned with a certificate. Now we have here a demo board and we'll just attach this thing here. So we'll just reboot the board. And you will see it will read all the certificate. Okay, first of all, it needs to connect to Wi-Fi. Uh, okay, it could not connect to Wi-Fi. Okay, it reads out uh, this, you see the endpoint actually, you see the ID of the device. Um, okay, Wi-Fi is not that great. Okay, he, now you see here um, it failed to connect to AWS IoT the first time. Now actually the provisioning should have happened and it, actually it has already happened. Uh, we now go back to AWS IoT. Um, we see here in the registry now uh, that the device is here. Um, you see that it the certificate is here, so I will just re, uh, reload this. So we have uh, another certificate. You see this is the ID that is coming uh, from the certificate itself. So the information was just transferred from the certificate. So you, there was no other way where uh, I need to send an Excel sheet or whatever yeah, uh, to provision this. And um, let's see if it's working. Um, there's actually a shadow wire. Um, can, you, can you just connect over? So what I will do now is I will update the shadow. So I'm on the other screen in the console. And let's put one of them off. Let you see it. I will put the middle off. So you see it should be here. Okay. So the complete registration process was automated. The provisioning is done on their side. In real case, you can try it out if you want to develop this. But uh, and then you can just uh, ship them and uh, scale out. Okay. So no need to pre-provision anything. You just do the certificates and some more information and you know what you want to do with this information, how you carve out the IoT policies and so on and so forth. Well, you, you will need to solder the chip on your end design. <laughs> okay. Then, yeah, let's get into details what actually is behind this one. So, thanks, Kerry. Yeah, let's... Uh... Ah, okay. Here you go. Well, thank you, Jan. Uh, just uh, wanted to point out that uh, those of you who aren't familiar with Atmel or Microchip, that uh, Microchip recently acquired Atmel. And so uh, you may hear us talk about Atmel and Microchip uh, interchangeably. That's because they're all one company now. So um, I think Jan and Anton talked a lot about all kinds of certificates and uh, uh, keys and certificate authorities and HSMs. That all sounds very good. If you've got, uh, if you work for a company that has a certificate authority all in place, you know all these things, this is a great answer, but um, you know, that makes it hard to bring a device to market. And so what we've done at Microchip is to kind of encapsulate really sort of all of the thing and manufacturing side of what Jan and Anton talked about into this little chip. It's a little tiny two millimeter by three millimeter chip. And the idea there is that allow you to focus on the customer experience, right? To build a gadget, 
a thing that does what customers want it to do without having to become security experts, think about certificate authorities, think about uh, keys, think about security. And encapsulate that all into one chip. Now, you know, if you kind of peel that back and say, what does it really mean to have a trusted identity? You know, Anton talked about devices have to have a trusted identity. They don't, they don't have a, a way to authorize themselves. Right? They have no keyboard. Um, well, that trusted identity in the digital world is a private key. It's just a string of bits. Now, you know, I'm sort of an analog kind of guy. You know, I look different than the next guy. It's hard to copy me, but, you know, my digital ID is really easy to copy. And if you copy my digital ID, you are me. Right? You digital copies are perfect copies. So somehow you have to prevent the digital ID, the thing that defines this thing, from being copied. Right? Because if I can copy it, now I have another thing. And those things are equal. There's no way to separate, uh, distinguish those two. And by the way, I'll make a point that is sometimes not completely clear when we talk about a certificate authority. A certificate authority is also a private key. And I can copy the private key of the certificate authority. And so those of you who think this is great, I'm going to put a certificate authority on my PC, and I'm going to sign all these gadgets on the manufacturing line. That's fine, except if anything goes wrong with that PC, or there's a virus or bad guys, now somebody else is also a certificate authority, and they're just as good as you. So, so you need some way to think about storing this private key in such a way that it can't be copied. That's not so trivial. So, I don't know, how many people are familiar with Heartbleed? Good, good, good. Ho hopefully it's all been solved in everybody's uh, system. And so the point I want to make here is Heartbleed was a wonderful way for me to take your keys out of your system. Right? So, so I'm thinking that, well, Heartbleed has probably been resolved. The next attack and the next attack and the next attack have not been resolved. And so Storing your private keys in software, storing them in some kind of general purpose computer, general purpose memory, or even in a memory in a microprocessor, probably isn't going to be a way to achieve that level of trust with your identity. So, so software probably isn't the answer. And uh, I'm going to say, you know, be careful about hardware. You know, a lot of people think about um, physical attack, right? I'm going to take the box apart and I'm going to probe some things inside the chip and I'm going to get some secret keys out. And, and that's probably a, a good way to do it and it it's, happens with surprising frequency and it's inexpensive to pay somebody to do it, by the way. But I'm going to talk about three things here that um, allow me to get inside your device without using a screwdriver. So the first one is a row hammer. It was an attack that was developed by a group at Google and it takes advantage of the fact that in most physical memories that live inside integrated circuits, uh, there's an issue called row disturb. So when you, when you affect the cell contents, contents in one row, the, the cells immediately adjacent to that get a little bit of an effect. And if you're careful about how you write all those cells and the memory is sufficiently sensitive, you can, by writing one row, impact some of the bits in the other row. This is great news if you want to get kernel privileges, right? Some bit in the other row is the thing that says whether you're in kernel or not. I attacked this other row. I have to be very clever about this, but Google actually executed this on a PC, showed that you could gain kernel access through row disturb. So it may be that things like Trust Zone, which appear to be a hardware protection, might not provide enough protection, right? Because Trust Zone is just an isolation mechanism. If I can break the isolation through row disturb, then those things might not be sufficient. Acoustic cryptanalysis, this is one I like a lot. Some guy, uh, you know, I sit on the other side of the conference room from you. I aim a microphone at your PC. I send you uh, uh, carefully chosen challenges. You respond to those challenges. And the way you respond to those challenges by using your secret and private information takes more or less current depending on what your key is. And because the current that you consume causes the capacitors and inductors in the power supply to vibrate at a slightly different rate, and I can hear them acoustically, I can find out what your keys are. OK, so this is, this is really nice, right? This is a good way. Um, so I can do that without you even knowing I did it, right? So I just send a challenge over. You respond to the challenge. So um, 
That's one way. The third way is really an old way. It's a 20-year-old method, timing attack. Most of you are probably familiar with the timing attack. I send you a challenge. I see how long it takes for you to say no, because this is a random challenge, right? Of course, I have no idea what the secret is that I'm looking for. And depending on how long it takes for you to say no, I change my responses, and instead of you know two to the n, I make it n order n uh, for the attacks. So um, timing attacks are actually relatively difficult to defend against in a completely holistic way. Um, if you think about writing software that's completely timing independent and takes the exact same amount of time, whether everything is good or everything is bad, you realize this is not such a trivial thing to do in a standard microprocessor, in standard software. So, um, you know, the message of the last couple slides is it would be a good thing to get the critical stuff out of your micro. There probably isn't a way for you to defend it if it's inside the micro, if it's inside the memory, if it's protected by software. What do I mean by critical stuff? Well, um, obviously, private keys, those the digital identities that I talked about. If you can't protect those digital identities, then I will become you. Um, but, you know, if you think about it, and Anton talked about elliptic curve software, that software is not trivial to write. It can have bugs. And it's usually the software that exposes the keys so that the, the acoustic attack depends on the software that was used. So that software also has to have to have access to the private keys. So if you're not going to let the private keys be on the micro, you can't let the elliptic curve software be on the micro either. So pull out stuff in a vault, um, security, high security for the keys and firmware, that's, that's an obvious thing. That's a good thing. Um, I'm not going to talk about root of trust for secure boot, but I think it, it goes without saying that validating the code you're about to execute is a good deal. Um, and when you think about that validation, it moves back through root of trust. That vault could be that root of trust. Um, if you're building a small thing that doesn't have a gigahertz processor in it, then executing elliptic curve um, algorithms is pretty slow. So uh, if you put it in a chip, you can maybe speed that up by 10 to 100 times, which is a big deal if you're trying to run off battery, right? Because that's reducing your power consumption window by that amount. And of course, maybe, maybe you can lower the cost of your micro by reducing the amount of memory. So uh, obviously, we're here talking about a particular chip. And a good question you should ask is, why is this chip a vault? Why is this more of a vault than the chip I'm using right now? And well, there are hundreds of reasons. I once actually compiled a spreadsheet of 100 different things that we do inside the chip, and I'm not going to bore you with all 100 here, trust me. But I will say that there are things that we do when we design a chip like this whose sole purpose is to protect secrets that I might do if I were designing a chip that was supposed to have a lot of I.O. and was supposed to have a lot of memory and was supposed to be really fast and was supposed to connect to Wi-Fi and 47 other things that I need a chip to do. We think about it in a little bit different way when we build this. So, you know, you can see in the top right that what we do on these kinds of chips is we have a shield on the chip. It's got a pattern running through. If you try and microprobe it, microprobes, by the way, are not expensive. A couple hundred bucks on eBay in your kitchen. It's really pretty easy to do a microprobe attack. If you cut any of those wires, if you short them, the chip's disabled. You know, all the internal memories, right? Every, every integrated circuit has memories inside it that store intermediate variables. We encrypt those memories with AES. Now, it makes the chip maybe a little bit slower than your favorite SOC, but it means that if you try and look at the way the memories respond to power, what you see is an encrypted value and not, not the, the, the secret. And this goes on and on. All the math is randomized through an internal random number generator. So when you look at the math signatures, you see the signatures of a random number and not the key. And so we do all these things to defend against all of the favorite kinds of attacks that the bad guys do. Uh, you know, microprobe attacks are, are sort of obvious ones. You kind of poke a needle down onto the chip. Timing attacks we talked about. Emissions attacks. Um, power analysis, differential power analysis is, is uh, the, the sort of trendy thing. Um, we see a lot now of people doing fault attacks on a chip, shine a laser on the chip. Uh, it's very effective. Old time uh, attack was uh, temperature. You know, stick your, stick your security chip in the oven and it'll do the wrong thing and it will let you uh, get the secrets out of it. So we defend against all these tampers. So when you put the secrets inside this chip, all those attacks fail. So every single one of them are defended, and that, that's what we do. That's, 
That's the value of this chip is to protect against those. So in your thing, comprehensive security, right? You've, you've put the keys there. In fact, the keys never leave the chip. There's no way. There isn't even a method for us or you or anybody else to get those private keys out of the chip. It just doesn't happen. So that's the thing. Now, you know, a lot of what Jan and Anton talked about is this certificate chain and this process of certificates moving back and forth. If you do that poorly, then you've got this very secure thing that no one can trust. Because, right, the trust comes from two things. One is, I believe that you've kept your private key private. That's the first thing. And the second is that I've trusted in the certificate chain that you present to connect this totally unique private key with some entity, some owner, some user, some manufacturer, some whatever. And so, so it's, it's just as important that you manage the certificate authority. Now, some of you probably work for companies that have a PKI infrastructure in place. And, and so you have things like high security modules. You have policies and procedures. Your companies are already set up to build certificates. That's good, but not everybody has that. And so the challenge here is that, well, most of us are going to make gadgets. Those little gadgets are going to have chips on them. The chips have got to be manufactured in some place. I don't know where the board shop is, but it's probably not down the street here. And so you may want to have them manufactured in lots of different shops. How do you protect that diverse manufacturing environment with an HSM, right? And, and you're going to build a whole secure HSM in every single one of those places? I don't think so. You're going to, you're going to slow down the manufacturing line to have them talk to the mothership every time one gadget comes off the line. I also don't think that that's practical. So, so what we do here is help provide security, so not only ease, but security from the factory side. So two, two ways of doing that. One is that the private keys are generated inside our chip from a random number generator. It's not like we have a list of private keys and we put them on there and the bad guys, you know, social engineering, give me the list, right? No, 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 we don't work that way. The keys are generated inside the chip. They simply don't exist outside the chip. Now, we generate the certificates on your behalf through world-class HSMs. These are, um, you know, the kinds of computers that governments and banks, who have a lot to protect with their keys, use to protect secrets. So we do that on your behalf in our state-of-the-art facilities, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So the idea is that you don't need to do this in your factory, and so bo both it improves the security of your factory, but it also simplifies the process. Sorry, you don't have to go talk to the manufacturing guy about something he doesn't want to hear about. So here's a picture of our HSMs. Uh, two things to know about this. One is that these are physically secure, right? So they're inside a locked rack, inside a locked and monitored room inside a secure facility. And it, it's expensive to build such a device or build such a, an environment in each of your manufacturing floors. And the other thing is that the, the high security modules themselves are highly secure by themselves. So if you open up the, the back of one of these, really the magic smoke in fact does leak out and you've got to send it back to the factory and um, buy a new one. So, very highly secure. It's done automatically for you. Jan showed uh, this demo kit uh, in his demo. This uh, kit is available from distributors. You could buy it now. All of the reference material is available. All of the software is there. It's on GitHub. So you can do whatever you want. You obviously don't have to use our kit. Uh, Anton's demonstration with uh, the other device. You don't have to use a, a microchip microprocessor. But this is easy for you to get started with it. I want to talk just a little bit about the process, right? It sounds a little exciting. So here, here's the chain of trust. There's going to be a root of trust at the top. That root of trust might be your existing OEM CA, might be a third-party CA. There are lots of companies whose stock and trade is being a CA. They can, they can manage the root. Uh, then there's the OEM CA. This is the CA that you create for your AWS IoT device. And then below that 
is a set of customer-specific production signers that lives in our factory. It could live in another factory as well, but um, so, so I have this chain of certificates, right? These are certificates. This is all one time, right? So we saw the uh, registration process earlier, both in slides and in a demo. So one time setup, you set up these production signers, and now you're going to go to manufacturing and build your gadget. The thing on the left, right, is the, is the process on the previous slide. And we take and add that on the bottom. We make lots of chips, each of which has a unique private ID, private key, each of which has a certificate attached to that private key. We make those. And then on the right hand side of this slide, um, you make your gadget, which is we ship the chip to you, you solder it on the board, you put it in a box, and you send it to a customer. That's all there is to it. Right? There's no there's no magic in the factory. There's no magic for customers either, right? They just plug it in. Here's the field. Here's what happens when somebody takes that thing out of the box. It's what uh, we already talked about in slides. The certificate automatically comes over, and it gets registered. And let me just emphasize the point that Jan made. Um, you know. It sometimes looks like this is pretty complicated, and in some ways it is. And if the only way for you to build your first 10 or 20 gadgets was to go set this whole thing up and create HSMs and buy 10,000 pieces for Matmel or whatever the minimum order is, that would be uh, an uncomfortable process for you to try and do alpha development. So that kit that you buy that Jan showed on the, on the screen also comes with these two dongles, one of which serves as the OEM certificate authority, another of which serves as the signing authority. So right there was those two attributes. If you go into volume production and microchip does that, the, the bottom dongle becomes part of our HSM, and the middle dongle might be, you might have, for instance, a third party certificate authority. But in the short term, in the lab, you can use these dongles, and they serve that same purpose. And they are, as Anton points out, they're an HSM that you can put in your pocket. Right? So they are just as secure. You can't get the keys out of those dongles either, by the way. But you could physically take the dongle away. That might be not a great answer. So in summary, I'm going to talk about two things here. One is securing that thing. Don't let anybody copy the private keys, the certificates. You copy the certificates, but without the private key, they're useless. So secure that thing. Maybe make it go a little faster, prevent software attack. And the other side of it is simplify both the manufacturer of the thing, right? It's a tiny little chip, 2 millimeter by 3 millimeter by 0.6 millimeter thick, so it's going to fit on all your boards. Um, and ease the manufacturing flow, right? So now we're providing this very robust certificate authority mechanism without you and your manufacturing team doing any work at all by the chips that are on. So that's the story with how we encapsulate this entire security environment into a single chip and simplify your process at the same time. So more security, more simplicity. So in summary, um, what we wanted to demonstrate it here is that we're allowing right now uh, for straightforward off-band certificate management. So whether you already have a fleet of the devices in the field, uh, you can easily register those certificates in a manual way, or you can utilize just-in-time registration. Um, elliptical curve uh, cryptography certificates, it's a big achievement for us to support. Um, <clears throat> Fine-grained uh, authorization through the five, uh, X509 uh, certificate policy variables and uh, think policy variables. And extensive partner ecosystem. So we, we just cover a few, but uh, literally just catch us in a hole uh, go to the to the expo hall and talk to the to the number of um, partners that AWS IoT team working with. And um, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Um, I know that the session was a little bit jammed. We've been trying to cover a lot of materials in a very short time, so don't hesitate to come up um, with with the questions. Um, 
and they told us that they will not release our tickets back if you will not complete your evaluation, so please do that. Thank you. Thanks a lot.